Some are, are big investors and some are smaller investors, but everybody is gaining from this project. Although the Danes have the largest proportion of electricity generation by wind in the world, as a country they still emit 9.8 metric tons of CO2 per person per year. So even though Danish renewable power generation has a long way to go before Denmark can claim to be a bona fide low carbon economy, wind power alone does provide electricity for 1.4 million homes. That is the whole of Western Denmark. Emerging economies at various stages of development are also making significant commitments. In June, China announced plans to produce a fifth of its energy needs from renewable sources by 2020 and earmarked $30 billion for low carbon projects. Korea plans to supply 100,000 homes using solar power by 2012, almost a tenfold increase over 2007. Isn't it amazing? that we right now are experiencing the biggest economic crisis for decades and still climate is on the agenda. What does that mean? That people have realized that we cannot solve the economic crisis unless we also solve the question of where is our energy going to come from and how are we going to solve the climate crisis? In part two, Nature Inc. discovers the cheapest and most effective economic tool for addressing climate change, nature itself. Welcome back to this edition of Nature Inc. and the economics of tackling global climate change. Our oceans, forests and peatlands act as sponges for carbon. Scientists call the process biosequestration. But they are getting alarmed that at the very time we should be taking steps to safeguard our no-cost CO2 sequesters, we are damaging them, in some cases beyond repair. The forests and oceans are the world's biggest carbon sinks. They absorb around a half of CO2 emissions produced by humans. But the global economy is clearing the forests and overburdening the seas. These scientists in Svalbard, an island archipelago deep inside the Arctic Circle, are analyzing the impact of increased CO2 levels in the water. Too much can lead to ocean acidification. One of the things we're looking at in this mess course is, of course, the production or the the sequestration of, of uh, carbon, and this is uh, carbon, mostly. As the water soaks up some of the extra CO2 from the atmosphere, so the chemical nature of the water changes from alkaline to acid. The effects could be disastrous. Under acidic conditions, shellfish and crabs are denied calcium to build their shells, and coral reefs die. Scientists debating rising CO2 levels recognize ocean acidification as potentially one of the most serious but least understood environmental impact. I'm very concerned about the risk of ocean acidification. In 30 years' time, um, you will not be looking at, a, at an ocean that is healthy because of CO2. Your kids will go down to the sea and see a sea in which coral reefs are no longer growing and in which reefs are beginning to dissolve. The impact on the world's fisheries could be immense. 520 million people are dependent on the fishing industry for their livelihood. Nearly 3 billion people, almost half the planet, rely on fish as an important source of protein. Not much more than half of the greenhouse gas emissions that, that humans emit into the atmosphere finally emerge in the atmosphere. They're taken up by ecosystems. If we had to pay for that currently free service, we would pay billions of dollars. Ecosystems and biodiversity has a gigantic value for human society. The UN World Conservation Monitoring Centre, based in Cambridge in the UK, has been studying the ability of the world's ecosystems to soak up and store CO2. Plants do this as a natural part of their, their biological process. So we don't really have to interfere and, and do anything with a technological fix. But what we need to do is make sure that we care for these um, natural systems so that we don't lose them, so that they can stay there, they can be well maintained, and that they can continue doing the kind of job that we need them to do. The centre has been using satellite imaging to map areas where biosequestration is highest. And let's have a look at the Amazon in more detail. Okay. Each tonne of CO2 soaked up 
prevents $85 of damage, according to Stern. The centre has estimated it costs the equivalent of just $10 per tonne of CO2 to restore soils and degraded land, making natural ecosystems highly cost-effective. Forests aren't the only ecosystem that matters. Looking at global averages, uh, tropical forests store typically about 160 tonnes per hectare of forest. Um, but looking at peatlands, the global averages is nearly 10 times higher at 1,450 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Peatlands are the most space-effective carbon stores of all ecosystems and are estimated to contain 550 gigatons of CO2, according to the centre. But globally, 65 million hectares of peatland, an area the size of France, is under threat from erosion, cutting or conversion to agricultural land. About a third of all the peatland is in Indonesia. This is peatland forest in the province of East Sumatra. But in February this year, Indonesia lifted a freeze on the use of peatlands for palm oil plantations, putting two million hectares at risk. This enormous plantation is in the North Riau province of Sumatra. Ironically, there is now increased demand for the oil as it's used in the production of supposedly eco-friendly biofuel. Once the drained peatland is taken into account, it's estimated that burning palm oil produces three to nine times the amount of CO2 as coal. Peatlands are also found in temperate regions. In the UK, 94% of raised peat bogs have already been lost to acid rain from decades of atmospheric pollution from cities and factories. It kills the mosses and lichens that bind the peat making them vulnerable to erosion and summer fires. There's a huge volume of, of peat that's been lost here. Um, and clearly the vegetation is going to find it very difficult to establish on those steep sides. And also the sort of vegetation we want, because peat bog vegetation needs a high water table. Now clearly the water table's gone because the surface is now down here rather than up here. Replanting cotton grasses helps bind the soil, erecting barriers to reduce the impact of flash floods and using biodegradable netting to stabilise gully sides further protects the landscape. This shows you what a healthy bog um, might look like. You've got here all of this, this green sort of moss here, in the bog mosses. But crucially, you can see here, if I just press there, you can see the water table really near the surface. This is what we're aiming to see, a healthy natural bog, good for wildlife, good for carbon storage and good for water quality as well. Even in their much reduced state, peatlands are the single largest carbon reserve in the UK. With around 3 billion tonnes, that's more carbon than in the forests of Britain and France combined. With the economies of the world looking to rebuild, protecting the natural environment provides new job opportunities. We have the climate change crisis with us right now, and we also have an employment crisis. And this biosequestration idea of paying people to manage ecosystems in a climate-friendly way opens up the possibility of new kinds of employment for those people who urgently need it, particularly in developing economies. The management of natural ecosystems for the goods and services they provide are bound up with the climate negotiations set to take place in Copenhagen in December. However, despite two weeks of preparatory talks in Bonn this June, Little progress has been made towards even agreeing a negotiating text. The draft negotiating texts are in some ways a mess. That's not the fault of the chairman, but because the party positions are somehow a mess, the country positions are not coherent and they're not enough. And I think that there has to be a major change in the political level of attention paid to the problem by heads of government. While delegates argue the details, the sheer scale of the challenge is difficult to grasp. According to Nate Lewis of the Californian Institute of Technology, we will need to build one nuclear reactor every two days for the next 40 years if we are going to stand any hope of keeping CO2 below dangerous levels. With the Intergovernmental Panel of Scientists asking for cuts between 25% and 40% of CO2 emissions by 2020, the emerging economies such as India and China have yet to make any commitment to reducing CO2. And of the developed world, Japan is offering 8%, 
the US 14% and the EU 20%. But will the world agree to what most scientists regard as meaningful cuts by the time of the Copenhagen meeting? The outlook seems bleak. I give you a prediction that it will not happen. Because the global agreement which is required is not politically attainable. Our work as a world over the last couple of years has created an opportunity. Now, will we take that opportunity? I'm not fully confident, but the opportunity is definitely there. It's now ours to squander. It's really sad that we, we, we lose such people when it can really be prevented. Stories that need to be told. <laughs>